today's agenda, um, let's. Uh, um, I'm planning to cover basically what uh, Rombi is, uh, introduce uh, to you the capabilities of um, uh, what we do at Rombi, um, and uh, um, the problems that we solve, our data pipeline, our architecture, how the data flows, um, and the challenges as, as we build it, and our serendipitous uh, discovery of Beam as uh, we changed our, our uh, data pipelines um, to, to cater to uh, our, our growing um, uh, loads of devices and uh, data incoming. So I'd like to keep the session interactive. Uh, please feel free to, to keep questions coming. I'll try to in, uh, include them as best as I can. Um, my, my biggest agent of today's talk is to share with you our story and a small shop like ourselves, basically, how we were able to get our journey started, uh, the pitfalls that we had going into it, and problems that, that we, we solved for ourselves. Um, I really um, feel that if it could inspire someone who's sitting on the fence like we were a few years ago uh, to, to take their existing uh, sort of investment and convert them into more defined pipelines such as Beams, uh, I think this would be a worth sort of uh, uh, for, for my effort. So introducing Rombi. Um, Rombi is in the business of providing actionable intelligence, a very loaded word, but essentially what this means is uh, we deploy our real-time sensors uh, and, and we collect our real-time data and then we provide intelligence based on this, this sensor data, which is uh, uh, we are the first class citizen of uh, receiving this first-hand data even before it gets in the hands of other people. So as things happen where you are not observing them, our sensors are observing them and that uh, sort of distinguishes uh, us uh, and, and the intelligence that we, that we provide is a lot more uh, real-time and a lot more actionable um, and before things go out of hand, uh, we have uh, capability to uh, get this intelligence in the hands of people who can take certain action and can change the outcome of uh, um, the, the, the different sort of uh, concerns that people have. These concerns are around product visibility, uh, goods condition in transit in terms of uh, temperature monitoring, shop monitoring, um, and uh, ambient light monitoring, for example. Uh, through our, our portable sensors. Uh, today, we run a gamut of different devices. Uh, there are many different SKUs that are purpose-built, anywhere from a small uh, BLE sensor to all the way um, uh, security solutions in the form of an intelligent lock that can only be logged and unlogged remotely or within a geofence. And uh, this is all powered by our platform uh, with hundreds of services uh, behind the scenes, uh, um, uh, several thousands um, of devices in circulation, millions of sensors uh, that they contain and billions of messages that flow through our system uh, today. Now, the journey or the story of Rombi starts with, with devices. Devices are our are, are, are core bread and butter, but that's not the value proposition that, that we have basically. The devices are uh, in a way means to our end where we need a very trustable source of data that we can bring in um, and it's very important that we govern that entire ecosystem, um, be it a, a Bluetooth beacon or a lock or a solar powered uh, devices that are mounted on top of uh, um, uh, payloads um, that can be recharged on the fly. With the various different sensor coverage, uh, we uh, have um, um, location, which is pure GPS and GSM, cell, uh, uh, cell tower triangulation, Wi-Fi signal uh, to determine the location accurately to all kinds of condition sensors. Um, that, that you can think of uh, temperature, shock, tilt, temper, um, going into many different industries, starting from pharma, food and beverages, um, chemical industries, and so on. This can be used to provide uh, visibility in a stationary use cases, or at the uh, pallet level, or the box level, or in container level, and track through various different uh, means of transportation, uh, be it on road, be it uh, air, uh, in the sea, or in railroads. And the sensors are deployed basically ubiquitously across the board. So we have global connectivity, um, the devices are always on, and we can pretty much track everything. Um, even when there is no coverage, basically we can track things through satellite as well. What problems do we look at uh, with this data? Um, so when it comes to looking at the problem sets, uh, we divide this into uh, two parts. Um, one being um, the first order of value, as we call it, exactly 
telling the story how we observe it. So as soon as we get the data from sensor, we'll tell the position of it. That's number one ask that customers have, where is my load? Where is my, my shipment, right? Uh, and that uh, location itself tells us a lot of things. So that's a real-time visibility and real-time condition monitoring. But now if you take it uh, to the next level, um, that location can indicate certain business signal to us. Are you inside an area where you can offload it? Uh, are you at a risk uh, because you are in an unknown area and you've been stopped for a while? Or have you a route deviated from the your designated path? And can we tell that in time so that that situation can be uh, averted from happening? Um, that's where our secondary level of uh, values come in place, where we analyze the lane. Uh, lane essentially is a combination of an origin and a destination. You start from one place, you go to another place. In supply chain world, uh, these lanes are pretty standard um, that people use. So once we have the standard lanes created, uh, we can provide a lot of analytics in terms of uh, time it takes, um, if, how does it variate, uh, uh, this variability, what is the condition uh, as we observe it, uh, how is the temperature variance coming in. And you can imagine in your head, basically, every data point that I talk about basically translate into, uh, into a pipeline um, that we would have to write. And then we have to see the outlier detection in that pipeline. Is it around condition? What is the causality of it? Uh, can we create a um, um, causality matrix and find out uh, what is the root cause of uh, these um, uh, outliers that we detect? And eventually to, to get into, can we do uh, help businesses do better modeling uh, through this data around their risk predictions, around their cost that they have of the inventory lockup on the road as they travel through it? Uh, can they do better demand prediction based on um, this data that we collect uh, on, the, on, the, on the fly? In a pictorial view, I think uh, there are these concerns that I just talked about, uh, um, different uh, sort of stakeholders uh, will uh, consume this data differently. Um, so starting from um, shipper basically or uh, a freight forwarder, they would be interested that have they picked up the right package, right? Did, do they have the right sort of uh, uh, way to check that? And, and uh, in this world, everything is sensorized or, or a, a, a trackable direct to cloud sensor has been attached to this package. So we can find that out. Um, we get the right alerts in the system. Uh, then we start tracking basically, is it on time? Uh, are there delays built in? Is there any weather conditions that this will get impacted? Um, I think the current supply chain delays are are not unknown to anyone. Basically, we are all, all are getting impacted by it. What is causing those uh, those delays? Basically, where uh, we have choke points in the supply chain. Uh, is it the port of LA? Is it the the um, origin point where we are having difficulty in getting the container loaded in the system? Uh, what are the port delays in the intermediary locations? All of this data gets collected and get fed into our algorithms, um, uh, our pipelines, and that's what uh, goes into into um, running our ML models as well as presenting this data in a, in a, uh, in a user-friendly manner. So looking at when we sort of started uh, um, about seven years ago, um, uh, we primarily had two skill sets in the team, uh, Node.js and Python. And uh, the initial version was literally, uh, we got a bunch of devices out from the market. We put together a basic uh, .NET system, um, wrote the data, read the data from the devices, and then built a nice uh, little dashboard. That was uh, perfect, basically, for a few tens of devices that we had. As we got into hundreds, uh, that basic system wasn't scaling. Uh, as the devices um, uh, send more data, more frequent data, that, that system was uh, giving up. Over the years, we added uh, Elasticsearch into it. We added uh, NoSQL databases. Uh, it took us to a certain point. But when we realized, basically, we cannot mix the operational data with the analytical data. So we start separating it out. and. Uh, at that time, basically, the, the, uh, our, our Python engineer said, we can easily take all this data that we have. We can write a simple ETL and uh, uh, give you um, the data warehouse view. So few hundred, few thousand devices we had, uh, this process worked out great. And uh, we built out uh, awesome dashboards and, and everybody was, was, was happy. Again, as time passed, basically, we added more devices. Business was successful. Uh, as we scale, uh, our queries become more expensive. It started putting bottlenecks on the source data. Aggregations took longer, um, and we put more logs basically in, in the read times, and our dashboard became expensive to read. In addition to this, uh, we could not take into account any customizations that customer wanted us to, to make. Uh, these pipelines were very, very rigid, basically. Uh, they literally were uh, Python scripts that were stitched together, and then um, they became uh, much longer, difficult to manage, um, and so on. 
we wrote some optimizer uh, glue in between um, trying to attach uh, and, and make them smart um, to reduce the pressure on the queries and aggregations. Uh, if the device is not in motion, we start ignoring that message or delay it. Uh, we started taking uh, time zones into account. Uh, if the customer is in US, we would do the processing basically in the nighttime and vice versa for other uh, time um, time zones. This, of course, did not work for uh, global customers. Um, we also added more indexes um, in, in our uh, um, sync databases. But all of this uh, um, did not really uh, work out for a very long time. And uh, we started, uh, again, getting back to the same uh, problems um, as such. We were not able to innovate fast enough. So we went back to whiteboard. Um, we looked at basically uh, writing these basic scripts and doing all the parallelization ourselves um, is not going to uh, pan out. It's not giving us the results. What should we do? We start looking at uh, um, what was there in the market. Uh, Hadoop uh, definitely was uh, first choice that came to market, um, you know, came into the mind. Uh, we looked at Storm. Uh, we looked at Flink. Uh, we looked at Spark. Spark was the most popular, I think, program at the time. Um, we actually spent a bunch of time with Spark. We looked at uh, Trino, um, and we looked at uh, Daxter. Uh, some of these technologies, um, um, I think, are very, very comparable to um, what we eventually chose um, as, as Beam. We actually spent uh, um, some good cycles basically trying to figure out uh, Spark and make it work. Uh, I think uh, Spark has very similar sort of uh, uh, programming paradigms, but um, the actual um, programming model uh, was quite complex. The learning, learning curve is steep. Also, I think Spark brings a lot of legacy with itself. Um, our engineers found themselves confused between uh, going from RDD to um, data frames and vice versa, and certain libraries are not supporting one or the other, and, and so on. So while we finished this exercise, or somewhat finished this exercise, um, our engineers were like, that's enough. We have, we have seen a lot. Uh, there's a lot that we've done. Can we just start working on one of these? So um, in lack of anything else, basically, uh, we blindly put our faith in, in Beams. We were liking what we were seeing. And uh, that gave rise to our final pipelines, um, where we were able to take pretty much all the different uh, um, investment we had in terms of data. Uh, we brought in our APIs, our static data uh, from our uh, data lake house, um, uh, from S3, and, and from different databases that we have in the system, uh, real time as well as uh, um, stored data. The transformations, um, as the need came in, basically we start adding more and more transformations and uh, wrote these pipelines, um, and then uh, we we built out a data mart a layer, basically that was specifically created to have um, uh, queries that uh, can run in, in real time and provide results uh, to our dashboards. This data also served as a basis uh, for feature engineering and uh, uh, fed into, into our ML models. Um, this gave us a freedom for deployment. Um, um, Beam out of the box supports basically uh, multiple runtimes. Um, we could deploy this on uh, Google Dataflow or a simple Kubernetes. Uh, from scaling perspective, uh, we could just literally scale the infrastructure by adding uh, more pods to Kubernetes and uh, um, more loads can be put on that. It allowed it to us to, to have uh, uh, customer inputs uh, being played out. The side input was uh, a, a very uh, interesting and very useful feature for us that we could uh, um, provide this uh, uh, intervention in, in the running pipelines. We also created a data catalog um, and then uh, wrote this uh, functional library. Um, it's not quite the full SDK yet, uh, but there are helper functions that will give you the data. And as a, as a uh, Beam job developer, you don't have to start anything from scratch. There are basic utilities that are built to source the data, to do the basic transformations, and then to store it in certain formats. And if you need to whip up your own, you can definitely do that. So um, this allowed us to uh, gain control back over the the, um, <clears throat> uh, the whole transformation process and the data pipelines that uh, we were running in. Um, to give you an example, um, this is uh, uh, one model basically that uh, uh, we developed to find out what is the communication recency rate of our devices. And what this means is uh, when a device, uh, a direct to cloud device is in the field, um, it can um, collect data and then it can send data. When it's collecting data, it needs to see if it can um, see a, a GPS uh, a satellite. At times it cannot because it's inside a container um, or if it is out and open, it can see the GPS. At the same time, it also needs a cell tower connection to be able to communicate. And sometimes one is available, other is not and so on. So if there is no cell coverage, then it will not be able to send this data. And then that data becomes backdated. And it will send the data when it gets a connection again in future. 
So the, the analysis we want to run is basically what is the percentage of devices that are getting GPS or GSM, um, which is uh, accurate location versus uh, not so accurate location. And then are they sending data immediately as it happens or are they they're sending us backdated data, right? So this was a simple analysis that we want to run. This data analysis essentially becomes a feature uh, when we go and uh, look at uh, what is the level of accuracy we can expect from our ETAs uh, what are the different lanes where we have better coverage, which becomes a part of a risk. So in the Beam language, essentially, this was reading this data from um, um, some kind of a sync uh, source. In this case, uh, this was uh, a MySQL database, um, getting the messages for each B, which are stored in the NoSQL um, Cassandra that we had, flattening this map out, creating partitions based on the technology um, of the accuracy, and then um, ultimately, to divide this into um, um, a timeline analysis or, or a windowed analysis of uh, is it backdated versus on time. So we have multiple such pipelines um, that run today and create this uh, runtime matrix um, and then um, um, retrain our models as well as produce uh, um, any actionable intelligence uh, to bubble it up. Now let's look at some of the reasons why we chose Beam as, as a tool of choice uh, for us. Um, the very first one is the performance, right? Uh, um, um, as I explained earlier, we uh, started experimenting with uh, Spark. Spark just did not have the right programming model for us to build out what we needed to build out. Um, and even if we could make our way through it a little bit, um, the, the challenges that we had in developing it and the way we deployed it basically in, in AWS infrastructure with Glue and uh, SageMaker, um, our build was just growing basically, right? We had to uh, spun up like two, 300 uh, workers. And most of the workers actually was not doing anything. It's just bottlenecks that we could not resolve. Um, we were paying for the services. So when we went from our pure Python-based backend to um, uh, Bean, we went from little over two days of entire analysis to be done uh, to less than an hour now. And all of this basically is done in a, in a commodity hardware. Uh, we have a, a very small cluster that we don't need to um, sort of scale any further, and it, it is able to cater to all that need that we have in an acceptable time frame that, that we have. So simple programming model of Beam, basically, you literally think about how do we get the data as a source, how do you transform it, including side input, very, very useful feature, uh, to where do you where are you going to store this? And you can pretty much fit any need in that uh, three simple steps of Beam. Very clean documentation, I think, uh, over the different uh, sort of uh, um, releases, I think team has managed to basically keep what is most relevant and most current um, as compared to some of the other technologies where versions uh, cause a lot of confusion. Um, native support for batch and streaming names suggest basically Beam um, is, is combination of um, um, stream and batch, um, which is very important for us. Uh, right now, we are doing mostly uh, batch jobs. Uh, we definitely plan to add more streaming into it. Um, the real-time aspect of it is uh, very critical to us. Uh, so far, we have not migrated that business into Beams, but we do plan to bring it in um, as teams getting a lot more comfortable with it. Um, we get the choice of development language, Java or Python, that uh, was very useful. Um, testability, the direct runner, uh, makes it really simple for us to get us uh, off the ground. Uh, you can test the flow before you deploy it uh, into the pipeline. And uh, the, the choice of development really makes it simpler for us in terms of uh, we can pick any cloud, and with a single click, we can we can get it deployed either in Kubernetes or uh, um, EMR or, or Dataflow. So um, I, I'm sort of coming to the end of, of my talk. Uh, essentially, we'd like to end it with um, some of the very interesting analysis that we have been able to finish uh, with this new capability. Um, um, I'll, I'll just pick one of the many here, uh, geofence elasticity, for example. Um, so what you're seeing in this diagram is uh, the boundary that is drawn is a geofence provided by the customer. Uh, but when we actually go and look at this data, we see many dots were observed outside of the, the, the fences. And uh, what we found out was uh, it's a warehouse uh, at Frankfurt Airport, but the warehouse gets full very quickly. Um, and when they don't have space, they will park certain material right outside and they have sort of regions defined where they can park it. So for us to distinguish whether this um, 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 packet is in transit uh, going through the same space versus it is actually there uh, for some time um, was an interesting analysis. And anytime we see that the package is staying there for longer than, um, let's say, 15 minutes, we will consider that as an extension of the geofence that you had. By having this elasticity in the geofence, we are able to provide more accurate ways of um, providing what is the dual time, how much time you spend inside those, those geofences. 
So that's one example of many um, that we um, sort of provide coverage on. Um, there's many more things that, that we plan to do uh, going forward, uh, such as crunching the, the geo boundaries, uh, the path that, that many shipments take, and bringing out a lot more uh, geospatial analysis uh, from it. Uh, I think um, Beam is the right tool in our opinion, and we sort of plan to invest more time. If somebody's interested uh, in knowing more about uh, Rombi or the use case or uh, IoT devices, uh, feel free to, to ping me. And uh, um, I, um, I, I can take some questions at this point. That's, that's all. I have.